Tonight's presentation titled, It's Baffling, is given by Mike Bush. And uh, Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated and an author for numerous aviation publications and uh, been giving weekly webinars uh, through the EAA webinar program almost since we started this. Mike has been the, the anchor uh, first Wednesday of every month for so many years. So thankful for Mike and his generous uh, gift to us sharing this information. Mike holds a certified flight instructor certificate. Uh, he's an A&P mechanic certificate holder with inspection authorization privilege and uh, 2008 Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year with the FAA and of course an EAA member. Mike, thank you so much. I'm gonna turn control the presentation over to you. Well, good evening, uh, Tim. Good evening, everybody. Um, have I really been doing this for 10 years, Tim? <laughs> My goodness. Oh, isn't it great? How must, time flies that, when you're having fun. I think that must mean I've done 120 of these webinars. That's a, that's a frightening thought. Oh, well, thank you for that. Um, let's see. Oh, there we go. Would you like me to take control? Yes, please. Okay, let me see if I can do that. And your screen is up. I'm seeing it. Oh, very good. Uh, I see it too. Excellent, excellent. <clears throat> well, as Tim mentioned, uh, the um, subject of tonight's webinar is it's the title is it's baffling and uh, we're going to be the picture sort of gives it away we're going to be talking about um, cooling baffles baffle seals and generally how our piston aircraft engines are cooled um, the the idea for this webinar uh, came to me when I received uh, a while ago a uh, an email from uh, the owner of a Cessna T210. Um, I'm not seeing my slide come up. Oh, maybe it is. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, and uh, he had emailed me that he had recently had his engine rebuilt, had a new baffle kit installed. Um, obviously, spent a lot of money. And then when he started flying the airplane with this new engine, he said the cylinders five and six those are the front cylinders on, on continental engines um are, are always uh, 20 or 30 degrees hotter than the rest um so during the climb the uh difference gets even bigger and he has a real hard time keeping the front two cylinders five and six uh below 400 degrees fahrenheit even with a full rich mixture and cow flaps open um of course, I had had some ideas of what he might do about that. But anyway, his his email went on, and this is what got me. He said, "Should I consider giving them some air?" Uh, well, what did he mean by that? Well, he sent me uh, some photos that he had kind of doctored up. Um, the uh, that that illustrated what he had in mind. And he said, um, on cylinder number six, <clears throat> which is the uh, left front cylinder on a Continental engine, Continentals and Lycomings number their cylinders in the opposite direction. Continentals number them from the back and Lycomings number them from the front. So this is a Continental um, IO5, uh, TSI IO520. And so number six cylinder, would be the left front cylinder. And he says, well, there's this, this baffle in front of the number six cylinder. Maybe I should cut a hole there and let some more air, a cooling air, get to that front cylinder. And um, on the other side, uh, cylinder number five, which in on this engine is the one that's right behind the oil cooler. He said, maybe I should drill some holes in that baffle that, that goes between the uh, the top of the oil cooler and the front of the number five cylinder and get some more air uh, on that cylinder that way by drilling some holes there. <clears throat> so I told the T210 owner that, that cutting these holes in his baffles was not a good idea. It would undoubtedly make his cooling problems worse, not better. 
and it it was apparent to me that the owner didn't understand how the cooling system in his airplane worked and exactly what the function of those baffles is. <clears throat> this owner was not alone. Um, even some a p mechanics don't fully understand how the cooling systems work, and I've seen some things that mechanics have done that compromised the cooling system. Um, they were well-intentioned, but they didn't really understand how the system worked. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight, um, how the cooling systems on our uh, piston uh, aircraft engines work. And uh, to start out, um, I'll take a little trip down memory lane and talk about how cooling systems worked back in the 1920s. Um, there's an airplane that you probably recognize that was flying in the 20s. And um, you can see that the uh, that the cylinders, uh, this of course is a radial engine, but the, the, the fin cylinders were just hanging out in the breeze. Um, and uh, they, they were mounted out there so that uh, the uh, uh, air from the from the slipstream would would pass over the cylinders from front to back and uh, and cool them. Uh, this is a system that was known as velocity cooling, and it was adequate um, back in the day uh, for cooling these single row radial engines. But then things got a little more complicated. Um, as engines grew more powerful, the radial engines became multi-row radials. Um, we started using horizontally opposed engines, which is what most of us fly behind today. Um, this velocity cooling system where the cylinders were hanging out in the breeze um, wasn't up to the job. I mean, if you think about a multi-roll radial, for example, if you let the cylinders sit out in the breeze, the front cylinders would get most of the cooling air and the rear cylinders would run hot, the rear row. Um, same with um, with horizontally opposed engines. If, if you just um, let uh, slipstream air pass over those cylinders, um, the front cylinders would get most of the air and the rear cylinders would run hot. Um, kind of the opposite situation is what our T10 owner was, T210 owner was seeing. Um, the, the other problem is that sticking all those cylinders out in the breeze causes horrendous cooling drag. Um, wasn't quite as much of a problem with the Spirit of St. Louis because it didn't fly very fast, but the cooling drag increases with the square of the airspeed. And so as our airplanes went faster, um, the idea of hanging cylinders out in the breeze became less and less attractive. So a better system was developed um, known as pressure cooling. And that's the method that's used on the airplanes that we fly today. Um, this is a, a photograph of a, a diamond uh, DA-50, I believe it is. And you can see that it's very streamlined. It, you know, has a very aerodynamic um, cowling over the engine. It's got some very, very small um, uh, cooling uh, intake holes at the front. But basically, this is a system that's designed for minimum cooling drag. Now, the way pressure cooling works is it is it's accomplished by placing a cowling around the engine so that it's not hanging out in the breeze, and then using a system of rigid baffles and flexible baffle seals um, to produce a volume and pattern of airflow necessary to achieve even cooling, where all the cylinders get about the, right, the same amount of cooling, and to do so with minimum drag. Now, there are a number of different ways that this is done depending on uh, the engine installation. But 95% of the airplanes that we fly today have a system that, that looks like this. And so I'll kind of talk about this because it represents what the way most of our aircraft engines are cooled nowadays. 
Um, and the way it works is that a, a series of baffles and, and flexible baffle seals are installed so that when the cowling is, is also installed, there is a region of high pressure above the engine. Um, the, the high pressure comes from air coming in through the cooling openings at the front of the cowling. And th there is a horizontal baffle uh, that, that runs along the top of the cylinders and a vertical baffle that runs behind the rear cylinder and baffle seals that, that seal this thing up, of, up, up against the cowling. And what that creates is, is a, essentially a box above the engine that is pressurized by high uh, by by ram air. Um, the rest of the cowling on the other side of this uh, series of baffles and baffle seals is a low pressure region, and it's made low pressure uh, by um, some openings down at the bottom of the cowl. Sometimes it's just a fixed opening. Sometimes uh, there are cowl flaps so that the size of the opening can be adjusted. Um, but that creates a low pressure area at the bottom. So we have a high pressure area at the top, low pressure area at the bottom, and we get vertical cooling airflow from the top to the bottom um, across all of the cylinders. And that way the front cylinders don't get more cooling air than the rear cylinders. Uh, and if the baffles and baffle seals are all configured correctly, all the cylinders get approximately the same amount of cooling air passing from the high pressure area on top to the low pressure area uh, on the bottom. Um, the volume of cooling airflow that passes over the cylinders from top to bottom, and, and again, this is the way most of our uh, systems work. There, there are some pipers, for example, uh, I know of some piper twins that where, where the cooling system is backwards and the high pressure is on the bottom of the engine and it flows from bottom to top, but those are real oddballs. So for, for most of our aircraft, it's a top to bottom system where the high pressure area is above the engine and the low pressure area is below. But the, the volume of airflow that passes across the cylinders is a function of the pressure differential between the high above the engine and the low below the engine. And we refer to that pressure differential as delta P. Um, and it's important to understand that the delta P in modern uh, aircraft engine installations is very small. Um, in fact, it's so small that it's normally measured in inches of water and it's typically six to seven inches of water. If we were measuring the, that pressure differential in PSI, it would be about a quarter of a PSI, very, very small pressure differential. And the reason the pressure differential is so small is intentionally. Aircraft designers try to keep this delta P as small as possible um, because the higher the delta P, the more the cooling drag. And we're trying to minimize cooling drag. So we want the delta P to be as small as we can get away with and still get the cylinders cooled. Um, here's an interesting installation. This, this is a, actually a Cessna T210 uh, installation that was put together by um, uh, Power Master Engines uh, in, in uh, Tulsa. Uh, this is um, um, the, the owner's personal airplane. And you can see it's very elegant cooling installation for, a, for an airplane as old as the T210. And you can see very clearly how a box was built around the top of the engine. And that box is the high pressure area and everything else is the low pressure area. And what you, you don't see in this picture is the top cowling. The top cowling is installed and it has some flexible rubber seals. The, you can see a, a little bit of that red stuff poking out uh, behind the nose bowl. Well, there are, are strips of that same red stuff attached to the upper cowling. And um, when the cowling is in place, those flexible red seals made up against the top of that rigid metal box that you're seeing that's painted white and create an airtight chamber that's pressurized by those cooling openings in the front. Um, and that's the high pressure area. And then everything else in the cowling is, is low pressure. 
And this airplane, and you can't see this in the picture either, but this airplane has cow flaps to regulate how low the low is. You know, as I mentioned, cow flaps can be used to modulate this airflow. Opening the cow flaps um, increases the, the vacuum, if you will, uh, in the lower chamber and increases delta P. So it increases the amount of cooling uh, airflow over the engine, but it also increases the drag. So typically we'll open the cowl flaps um, in situations where there's a high cooling demand like a climb where the airspeed is low and the engine needs more cooling. And then once we get into cruise, we can close the cowl flaps and that reduces the delta P and reduces the drag and gives us a little extra airspeed. Uh, because this delta P is so tiny, a quarter of a PSI, even small leaks in this system that make the 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 system non airtight um, can have serious adverse consequences on cylinder cooling. So when we deal with a with a, a, an engine that where cylinder head temperatures are uneven or running too hot, we we need to look in detail at exactly how everything is sealing up and make sure that the system is is airtight because delta p is very small and we can't afford to squander any of it so any any missing or broken or improperly positioned baffles or or flexible baffle seals will seriously degrade engine cooling by providing an unintended alternate path for that air to pass from the high pressure area to the low pressure area without going over the cylinder fins. If our system is set up correctly, then all of the air will pass over the cylinder fins and none of it will get lost. But but if it's if if it's got leaks in it, um, then we lose some of that air um, through paths other than going over the cylinder fins, and then then we wind up with engine cooling problems. And this is exactly why this owner's idea of drilling holes in the baffle would have been a bad idea, because what it would have simply done is provide a path for air to get into the low pressure area without doing any useful cooling. Um, he was obviously under the impression that that those front cylinders are, are cooled by ram air going from front to back didn't really understand that what we're trying to do is get the air to go from top to bottom. Um, here's a picture of a more conventional uh, T210 cooling installation. Um, and the, the box isn't quite as evident, but you can see that at the top of the rigid baffles are uh, some flexible baffle seals. In this case, the seals are mounted to the baffles rather than mounted to the cowling. And if we take a close look at those baffles, you can sort of see the the rub marks on those baffle seals. And, and you, by looking at the rub marks, you can see whether they were making good contact with the upper cowling or not. And um, the the uh, I, I misspoke. This, this this what we're looking at is is rigid. The the flexible baffle seals are connected to the cowling. But we can look at the rub marks on on the aluminum here and see that that there's an area where those baffle seals were making good contact and there's a nice broad rub mark. And then there are a couple of areas where the baffle seals obviously weren't pressing up against the metal because there's hardly any rub mark at all. And so inspecting things, looking for that contact is a, is one good way of determining whether the uh, whether the baffles and baffle seals are making an airtight fit that will prevent air from being lost uh, other than passing through the cooling fins. Uh, I'll show you another another way that we we do that a little bit later in the presentation. Now getting all of this because the engine is a very irregular shape and the cylinders are pretty complicated in shape Sealing this stuff up is pretty complicated. Um, here, here's a picture of a of a baffle kit for a T210, and you, you can see all the different 
funny shaped pieces of metal that are required to 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 get this thing all set up correctly it, it, the baffle kit is very complicated um because every little path that air can take other than going over the cooling fins needs to be plugged by a baffle and so there's a lots of little pieces of metal that have to be positioned all just right in order to accomplish that goal um, one of the most problematic parts of the cooling system are these flexible baffle seals they're typically made of silicone rubber. Sometimes they're black, sometimes they're blue, sometimes they're red. But they're used to seal up the gaps between the rigid sheet metal baffles and the cowlings. And the reason that we need them is because the engine is mounted on shock mounts. And so it rocks a little bit um, on the shock mounts. Um, and so if the if the rigid baffles actually touch the cowling, then when the engine rock and baffles are connected to the engine it would damage the, the baffles so we need a little bit of gap between the rigid baffles and the cowling and we fill that gap with these flexible baffle seals um, it's really important that the baffle seals be oriented correctly they have to be curved towards the high pressure area so that when the airplane's in flight and the, that upper compartment pressure rises the delta P actually forces the flexible baffle seals against the cowling, or in the case of the T210, um, the, the cowling mounted baffles are, are forced against the, uh, the, the rigid box. Um, but it's the air pressure that seals these, these um, flexible seals tightly uh, against the surface. So Here's an here here's a case where in the top picture these baffle seals are are oriented or are bent towards the high pressure area so that they seal up tightly when the aircraft is in flight, and the bottom picture indicates where these baffle seals are 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 bent the wrong direction. Something that's quite easy to do if you install a cowling and you're in a hurry and you don't you aren't real careful. Um, and if they're bent the wrong way, then when the high pressure area uh, pressurizes, it, it'll blow the, the baffle seals away and it'll let air escape. Um, so it's really important to check that out. Um, every time you reinstall the, the, the top cowling, you have to make sure that these flexible baffle seals are oriented in the correct direction. Otherwise, you're going to lose a lot of cooling air when the airplane's in flight. Another common problem, and we'll see some pictures of this shortly, uh, is that uh, wrinkles or creases may develop in these flexible baffles um, so that when the cowling is installed, uh, there are places where it doesn't make good contact. And we saw earlier an example of where some of the flexible seals were making good contact with the metal and some of them weren't. But it's really important they all make good contact and they all be oriented in the correct direction. Another problem we run into a lot with these systems is um, baffles that people don't think about very much. They're called inner cylinder baffles. And they're small, peculiarly shaped pieces of metal that are mounted below and between the cylinders. Um, here, here's an example on a Lycoming engine. We're looking at the up towards the bottom of the engine, the exhaust and in induction system are removed. The spark plugs are the bottom spark plugs. And the inter-cylinder baffle is that strange piece, strange shapely piece of metal that I've kind of outlined with a dotted uh, line um, that plug up the gap between the cylinders. And the purpose of the inter-cylinder baffles is to make sure that none of the cooling air can just go cruising down through the slot between the cylinders. Uh, the inter-cylinder baffle forces that air to go through the cooling fins and to sort of wrap around the cylinders and get the maximum amount of cooling done in the process before the, the air gets to the to the lower chamber. These inner cylinder baffles are kind of out of sight and out of mind a lot. They're down below the cylinders where they're really hard to see, especially when the induction and exhaust system are installed. Um, but if they aren't positioned correctly, or if they're if they're missing or or mispositioned somehow. Uh, it can have a devastating effect on on cooling. 
Again, I think I just said all this, <clears throat> but their purpose is to prevent the cooling air from 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 going down between the cylinders without uh, doing any cooling. It, it forces the uh, that air to go through the fins and and kind of wrap around the the cylinder uh, on its way down to the low pressure area. Um, in a recent webinar that I did, I, I highlighted a problem that we'd run into on a Cirrus. Um, this was an IO550, and um, it's got six cylinders, so it's got four inner cylinder baffles to plug the gaps between those six cylinders. And this airplane was having a, a, a real bad problem with the the number five cylinder, uh, right front cylinder running hot. And it turns out that the the inner cylinder baffle that goes between three and five and the inner cylinder baffle that goes between one and three are different. They they are very similar looking, but they aren't the same. They've got different part numbers. They're they're different in shape subtly. And when some cylinder work was done on this engine, the the mechanic who wasn't really aware of the fact that these baffles were were different, um, wound up uh, putting them in backwards, so that the front one was in the rear and the rear one was in the front, and it had a a huge effect on engine cooling. And it actually took this owner something like three annual inspections before a really sharp-eyed mechanic was able to spot the fact that these baffles had been reinstalled uh, backwards, uh, in the front one in the rear and the rear one in the front. As I said, you can look at the pictures here. These are out of the parts manual. They look very similar. Um, but they aren't the same. And it's, it was really important that the right one be in the right spot and, and they got backwards. Uh, anytime you do cylinder work and you have to take these things off in order to remove the cylinders, uh, you run the risk of having them reinstalled incorrectly. So with all that said, let's get back to our T210 and talk about why his cylinders were running hot. Um, I had him take a bunch of pictures for me, um, including some pictures with the cowling installed. And when I looked at the pictures, this was the worst of the pictures. Um, it was very obvious why he was having cooling problems. Here's a flexible seal that's supposed to be sealing against that cowling. And you can see the big giant wrinkle in it that's allowing a whole bunch of cooling air to escape because it's not making proper contact with the cowling. Um, I went over all these pictures that he sent me and identified about a dozen different leaks in the in the system. Some of them were small leaks, some of them were bigger leaks like the one I just showed you, but combined they accounted for a very significant loss of, of cooling efficiency. And by going through the system, um, uh, trimming uh, some of the um, flexible seals, uh, plugging up some of the little leaks with the high temperature RTV. Um, with a little bit of work, the owner succeeded in fixing all of these problems and his, uh, his cooling problems, uh, not surprisingly, went away. So Tim, with that, um, why don't we open it up to a little bit of Q&A? Okay, Mike, uh, let's get into some <laughs> I, questions. I think, yeah, I yeah, think you I caught me off guard. You weren't ready for that. I'm going to have to give you a high sign. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to put my headset on. Yep. Okay, so uh, let's go with John's question. Um, where would I find a factory diagram for intercylinder baffles placement and location? Well, the... the um, uh, you You will see the inner cylinder baffles in the parts manual, and it's probably going to be the parts manual for the airframe. These, these are typically airframe parts, not engine parts. Um, but you'll find the um, uh, the, the baffles um, in, in the parts manual with their part numbers and so on. 
Um, as far as positioning them, uh, most of the manuals aren't terribly explicit about how, how they should be positioned. And so I, I recommend the following. And when people are having cooling system problems, this is one of the things I recommend that they do. Um, assuming that you have, you know, sort of a conventional top to bottom cooling system like 98% you know, of the airplanes have. Um, put, preferably put the airplane in a relatively dark hangar with the top cowl removed. Stick a really bright light down below the engine, like a, a shop light, 100 watt shop light or something. And then stand on a little ladder and look straight down from the top of the engine and see if you see any light coming through. You shouldn't. If you can see the light that you put down below the engine when you're standing on, uh, above the engine looking down, then, then you found a gap that cooling air can get through. You shouldn't be able to see any light. Um, and that's a really good test of whether the inner cylinder baffles are or properly uh, positioned because you're basically using the light as sort of a proxy for the for the air. Um, and uh, again, if if any light is visible from the top of the engine, um, that that means that there's a gap somewhere that the cooling air is going to escape through. John's wondering: Do baffles wear out? Uh, yeah, they actually do. They, the most often, what happens to them is they crack from vibration, and if it's a small crack, um, it, it can typically be stop drilled and a little double riveted on. If it's a big crack, then then then, then typically the baffle uh, is going to have to get replaced. Um, we also sometimes see baffles um, deteriorate from corrosion. And if the corrosion is bad enough, then it might be worth replacing the baffle. But mo mostly what we see is, is, is the rigid baffles cracking just from the vibration. Obviously, they're subject to high vibration. They're mounted to the engine, which is shaking all the time. Several people are wondering about fiberglass plenums. And what are your thoughts on that? Um, a lot of experimentals are equipped yeah, with you, that. Yeah, using fiberglass instead of, uh, you know, I, I honestly don't have any experience with that. I, it, I mean, it sounds like a great idea to me because the fiberglass is probably less likely to uh, to crack and certainly it's not going to be corroding uh, the way aluminum baffles do. Um, but um, in, in my practice is typically confined to uh, a certificated aircraft and I have not run into um, uh, composite uh, engine baffles, but it, it sounds like a great idea. Alan's just wondering, what can uh, you do when the flexible baffle seals get wrinkles in them? Um, well, sometimes you can just uh, you can just trim them, maybe cut a slot uh, in them so that they so that they lay flat. Worst comes to the worst is you uh, uh, you you remove them and put new flexible seals in. Normally, those um, baffle seals are um, connected to the rigid baffles um, with most often with, with something like pop rivets. Um, and, and so it's not a really big deal to remove them and, and, and put new baffling in. Um, some of the older airplanes were uh, were built with uh, with cloth reinforced rubber baffles, which which this kind of predated the 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 modern silicone rubber baffles that we use nowadays, baffle seals that we use nowadays, and that 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 old black stuff was just terrible, and it usually got all floppy and useless. Um, so and there's still airplanes flying around with that old stuff. If you have it, it's best to just get rid of it and put some nice uh, modern flexible baffle seal material, and it's made of silicone, a silicone rubber, um, artificial rubber, um, which which wears a whole lot better and seals a lot better. 
Elvin's wondering, um, are there any better quality, flexible baffling seals available other than the silicone ones? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the silicone ones are are the best, and they and they they they're very good. They last a long time. They wear very well. Um, the the important thing is to is is to install them right so that they do seal up properly when the cowling is installed. And a lot of people will will install these baffles, but never really check to make sure that they are sealing correctly and that there aren't any you know, funny wrinkles or like like the ones I showed you uh, when the top cowlings install. So ag again, it's important. You know, nowadays it's so easy to to you know stick a bore scope or something in the front of the engine cowling and take a really good look around at, at how everything is is looking with the cowling install. Um, and if there are, are any areas where there are you know there there, there are gaps. That aren't sealing correctly, then you, you just you just need to fix them, and usually that fixing just requires doing a little trimming of the baffles so that they lay nice and flat and and seal up well. Richard's wondering what's the best way to seal flexible baffles to each other. Um, the 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 way I do it on my airplane, I don't even know what the name of these things are, but there are uh, there are special fasteners that are designed to do this, that that are basically kind of like a, a a riv nut, a screw on one side and a riv nut on the other side, but with big giant, um, very very flat uh, faces to them, that that are designed to clamp. Um, uh, two pieces of baffle seal together, um, and um, I, I don't even remember what they're called, but they're specifically designed for that purpose. And I, you know, I bought a little bag of them and used them to 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 fasten the baffles together. Uh, they, they work real well because they they when you if you need to disassemble something, they simply unscrew from one of the 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 rib nut part and the and the screw part just just unscrew from one another and the, that releases the the baffle so that they're easy to take apart and easy to put back together. I wish I knew what the right name of them was or a part number, but I just I just don't from offhand. I know what they look like, but <clears throat> James is wondering, um, and and several people have asked this in different ways, but what's the best way to measure delta p? And do you do that on the ground? Well, it, it's it's unusual to to actually measure it. Um, you you would have to use something like a water manometer and with a pair of tubes <clears throat> going into the cowling, one at the top part and one at the bottom part. But uh, I, you know, it's not something that that normally is done except you know by Aircraft engineers in the process of developing the cooling system. Uh, it's it's not something that I've ever seen done, you know, in a maintenance shop. And we got so many aircraft builders on this yeah. webinar tonight, building their own plane, trying to yeah, trying to figure this out. Yeah. But wow. I mean, the main thing to understand is that delta p is if if, if delta p is typically very small, mm -hmm. so you, you need to use something pretty sensitive. Uh, to to measure it, Lucas is just wondering. I, I, I wonder if I wonder if you could use an old airspeed indicator. That might that might be sensitive enough to measure it well. <laughs> hmm. um, Lucas is wondering: is is there any rule of thumb or a, a good ratio for the inlet air to the exhaust air and the size of the openings for proper pressure recovery and cooling? I'm, I'm sure there is, and, and that unfortunately that's a question above my pay grade because I'm I'm not not a home builder and I've never really got into the the, the process of designing these things. Um, it, it's really interesting if you look at, um, let's say an aircraft like the like the 210 that was designed back in the 50s and 60s. 
and then you compare it with an airplane like a, a Diamond or a Cirrus or Columbia 400 or something that was designed in the 90s, um, the difference in the size of the air intakes is really dramatic. The, the older airplanes use these big giant air intakes and the new ones use little bitty tiny ones, uh, which are, are, are much uh, less draggy. And um, uh, when you look at the baffling, uh, the, the new airplanes do a much better job of, of baffling the engines and, and they typically use a lot more rigid and a lot fewer flexible uh, to do it. Um, uh, and so that they get away with, with, with smaller air inlets just because the cooling system is, is so much more efficient. You know, back in the old days, the engineers kind of had to go by guesswork. Um, nowadays, uh, we've got the ability to instrument this stuff, to put, you know, little CCD cameras under the cowling to tough the engine compartment and see exactly what the airflow is looking like. We, we've got a lot of really good tools. And so aircraft that were designed more recently tend to have much, much better cooling systems. Uh, than, than the legacy aircraft do. Dan's wondering, when opening the cowl flaps, does that add parasitic drag in addition to cooling drag? Well, it probably adds a little bit, but the main thing it adds is cooling drag. It simply increases the the the, the airflow volume over the engine, and of course that that uh, translates into into drag, I suppose. Um, I, I don't know what kind of drag you'd call that. <laughs> and um, William wonders, do engines ever run too cool? Um, they can. Um, you know, I, I did a, a webinar a, a few months ago um, about sticking valves and talked about the fact that um, we need the cylinders to run warm enough that um, that the lead scavenging agent in the in our avgas um, can do a decent job of scavenging. We don't want them to run too warm because that that um, uh, creates longevity problems for the cylinders. But we don't want them to run too cool because we wind up getting excessive lead deposits and and particularly deposits on valve stems and so on. As we gradually, hopefully, start transitioning from leaded gasoline to unleaded um, gas, and you know those of you who are able to run on unleaded mo gas are on the on the leading edge of this. Um, Though we won't have to worry so much about that, and uh, but basically, if you're running the engine on leaded fuel, um, a good way to judge whether the engine's running too cool is to simply, you know, check the spark plugs when when it's time to pull the spark plugs and clean them. If they've got a lot of lead buildup in there, you see a lot of little balls of metallic lead, then you're probably not. Um, running the engine warm enough and usually leaning a little bit more aggressively and so on will 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 help that. Uh, if the spark plugs come out and they're you know relatively free of of lead deposits, um, I'm I'm not talking about carbon or any of that stuff. I'm talking about metallic lead, um, then you probably don't have to worry about the cylinders running too cool because you're you're doing fine. So that's a good way to 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 judge that. And again, if you're running unleaded fuel, um, and the, some certificated aircraft are, are, are eligible for an STC that lets them run on uh, on MoGas, and I think quite a few um, experimentals are running on MoGas. I know the Rotax engines like or prefer to run on on, uh, on unleaded fuel. Um, then you don't don't really have to worry about the uh, cylinders running too cool. Because that's really the, the the main constraint is light scavenging. 
Ray is wondering, and several people have asked a question about this, but um, what kind of high temp RTV is acceptable to use? Red. <laughs> the the um, um, I mean, if you if you if you go to the Spruce catalog or something, you'll see that they sell different grades of RTV, and one of them is high temp RTV and it's invariably red. I don't know why. I think that's just tradition. Um, but the red stuff is the is the high temp stuff. Okay. Casey is just wondering, does the likelihood there, there, of there's an official Dow part number for, for the high temp stuff. I I just don't know it off the top of my head, but Dow Corning uh is the primary maker of, of that stuff and, and there's a particular Dow Corning part number for high temp RTV. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple specific ones here. John wonders, I am experiencing a continuously hot cylinder number two on a Lycoming 2001 T182T. What should I look for in the baffling to see if there is something that can be done to improve airflow? Well, the, you know, the number the number two cylinder um, on a Lycoming is one of the front cylinders. Um, the the you know the inner cylinder baffle thing that I talked about is is one of the first things to look for. Um, when when we see one cylinder running hot, um, the probability that it's an inner cylinder baffle problem is fairly high because problems with the with the, the 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 top mounted baffles usually affect more than one cylinder um, so that's the first place I would look um, but in general um, uh, in inspecting uh, the, the entire system for for potential leaks uh, is important and you know, most of the time, when if you look at an aircraft, you'll you'll find a bunch of these things. Some of them are quite small and they seem insignificant, but uh, collectively they can make us make a big difference. But if there's just one cylinder that's that's way away from the pack, um, uh, inner cylinder baffle is the first place I'd look. Uh, another thing is, and and I I didn't get which kind of engine it is, but if it's a if it's a fuel injected engine, well, in general, it's a good idea to do what's called a gamoline test um, to determine whether all of the cylinders are running at approximately the same mixture, or if, if if one of the cylinders is a lean outlier, that might be why it's running hot. It might not be cooling air. It might be um, that it's not getting as much fuel as the other cylinders, and that's very very easy to check with a with a gamoline test, assuming that you have an engine monitor installed because you just do some very slow sweeps with the mixture control and uh, find out uh, at what fuel flow each cylinder peaks. They, they all ought to peak pretty close to the same fuel flow. And if you know one of them hits peak at a, at a higher fuel flow than the others, then you know it's running leaner than the others and you need to figure out why. If it's a carbureted engine, um, then, uh, is, is a possibility that you also you might have an induction leak on that cylinder that's that's causing it to run leaner than the others but you can rule that in or out very very quickly in a single test flight just by doing a, a mixture sweep and watching where the egt's peak if the egt's are all peaking about the same place uh, plus or minus a half a gallon an hour or so um then it, it's it's not going to be a fuel problem and it's undoubtedly going to be a cooling air problem so when we have a hot running cylinder first thing we want to do is determine you know whether it's a, a cooling air problem or whether it's a, a fuel flow problem and that takes just a single test flight to figure that out um, uh, another thing is if the cylinder is running if, if you have a cylinder that's running leaner than the others then it's going to be hotter than the other cylinders if you're running richer peak, but it's going to be cooler than the other cylinders if you're running leaner peak. 
if the cylinder is the hottest cylinder, both Richard Peak and Lena Peak, then you can be pretty sure it's a cooling air problem. Okay, and uh, let's see, Daniel is wondering, on my PA28-180, 0360, my engine monitor tells me the difference between the front and rear cylinders is consistently 35 to 40 degrees. Is this an acceptable spread? It, it is. For, for a, an airplane like that, which is a, a legacy aircraft, uh, um, the cooling systems, as I said, were not all that well designed. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm flying a Cessna 310 that was also designed back in the 50s. Um, and, and it's just kind of a fact of life. We have to accept that the, the, the CHT spread is, is going to be 40, 50, 60 degrees from one cylinder to the next. Um, the, the newer designed airplanes tend to have much more even. Uh, temperature distribution between their CHT distribution between the cylinders because their cooling systems were just better designed. The, the engineers that designed them had better tools at their disposal. Um, but for legacy aircraft like, uh, you know, the PA-28s or the MySesta 310, we just have to live with the fact that our cooling systems were not terribly well designed. And if we have a, you know, a CHT spread of 40, 50, 60 degrees. That's just uh, something that we have to live with. It's just the nature of the of the beast. Um, it, we, we still have to make sure that the cooling system is as good as it can be and doesn't have any leaks, but we're never gonna get um, really even cooling be, just because the system is pretty crude. Paul is wondering, can you provide some discussion about winterization kits and how that might affect cylinder cooling and low oil temps? Well, a winterization kit um, typically um, includes a, a, a temporary baffle that's installed in the winter that, that uh, restricts the airflow through the oil cooler in order to um, uh, keep the oil temperature higher. Um, some winterization kits also include uh, baffles that restrict cylinder airflow, but the main thing that, that they, they all do is, is uh, restrict uh, airflow through the oil cooler. And if you restrict air through th airflow through the oil cooler, you, you're probably gonna, you know, increase the amount of cooling airflow over the cylinders because the airflow that would normally be lost through the oil cooler, the, the, the delta P that's normally is lost through the oil cooler winds up being less. Uh, so it would probably actually increase the, the cooling of the cylinders uh, to put a, a, a temporary, you know, partial baffle in front of the oil cooler. Um, as I said, the, 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 the winterization kits are are very customized to particular aircraft uh, and engine installation. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, how much more I can say about it. Dusty wonders, is shock cooling a real thing? And if so, how do you avoid it? Um, well, shock cooling is a real thing, but it's not as real as we used to think. Uh, and <laughs> But by that, I mean, um, well, I think Lycoming probably did the best job. They, they, they actually have a specific recommendation with regard to this. Uh, and they say that, that, um, that they want the cylinder cool down to, to be limited to no more than 60 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. Um, and it turns out that it's very difficult to get cylinders to cool down that fast. Um, it, it takes a very abrupt, I guess what I'd call a, a slam dunk maneuver where you 
you know, pull a throttle back and, and shove the nose down. Um, you have to really work at it. I, I have my engine monitor set up to alarm anytime the cool down rate is over 30 degrees Fahrenheit per minute, which is half of the, the what Lycoming wants to limit it to. So it's very conservative. And, you know, to be honest with you, I, I, I think that alarm goes off like once every three years or something. <laughs> it's, it turns out to be pretty hard to, to get cylinders to cool down that fast. Um, so it's not as big a problem as we used to think. Back, you know, when I started flying, the, the, the you know, there was this this cult that said, you know, we should only reduce manifold pressure by an, an inch a minute or something like that to prevent shock cooling. And then once we started getting good instrumentation in there, so we could actually watch the cool down rate, it, it turned out that all of that was really unnecessary. And that unless you do something really very abrupt in terms of yanking the power back and shoving the nose down, um, that, that you're not going to get even close to that 60 degrees per minute limitation that, that Lycoming recommends. James wonders, um, he says, my engine uh, in my RV6A has two holes in the rear baffle that are connected to hoses that provide cooling air to the alternator. He's wondering, is this decreasing my cylinder cooling in favor of increasing cooling to the alternator? Uh, it is, and it, it's, it's sort of a calculated trade-off. Um, the, the, the alternator, if, if the alternator is mounted um, behind the engine, and I'm I'm a little bit surprised to hear that because I thought RVs usually were powered by Lycomings, and typically those things have alternators mounted up front. But if you do have a rear-mounted alternator, um, the the area behind the engine is it, it typically runs pretty hot, and the alternators need some cooling air um, over their rectifier assembly. Um, the uh, cool, uh, alternators typically have a series of cooling slots uh, on the rear of the alternator, on the, the non-drive end of the alternator, um, where the rectifier assembly is. And, and it, the, those diodes need to be kept cool, otherwise they'll burn out and you wind up having alternator failures. So that blast tube that you're talking about is uh, is sort of a calculated trade-off to say, in order to preserve the alternator diodes from getting too hot and cooking themselves, we're, we're going to steal a little cooling air from the engine. Uh, whether the the blast tubes are providing more air than the alternator needs to keep cool, that that's something you would have to instrument and to try to find out maybe you know if you're really interested you could you know mount a thermistor or something in the back of the alternator and see just how warm those things are running in flight and maybe you could get away with a little bit of less blast air going back to cool the alternator but i i do know from experience in the cessna world which they they typically have belt mounted alternators in the rear and they typically have a blast tube like what you describe and sometimes when engines uh, get um, overhauled or replaced the mechanic who installs the engine and didn't really understand what that blast tube was all about anyway will will forget to put the blast tube in or will put it in but won't position the 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 end of it in the right place where it blows on the right side of the alternator and when that happens, we we will see the alternators, you know, cooking themselves to death and 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 failing after a few hundred hours, simply because the the diodes are just not getting in there. They're in in the rectifier assembly, are not getting enough cooling. So that cooling air is important. Whether or not you're getting more than you need is a, is a, another question. I I can't really answer that. But you, if you were really interested, you could do some experimentation to find out. Jay says, it is an honor to hear Mike Bush live. Thank you. And he asks, 
Can baffle problems cause other temperature issues such as an EGT and oil temperature in addition to the CHT temperatures? Well, first of all, it's an honor to be live. <laughs> <laughs> sure beats the alternative. Um, the certainly the the uh, the the baffle uh, assembly uh, typically will affect not only the cooling of the cylinders but also the uh, the the cooling air that passes through the oil cooler. So uh, problems with the baffles could certainly affect uh, oil temperature. Now, frequently that's masked because the oil temperature in our engines is thermostatically controlled. Um, and typically the oil coolers have more capacity than, than are needed in there. The, therm the oil thermostat, the vernotherm, um, causes only a fraction of the oil uh, flow to pass through the, the um, oil cooler most of the time. Um, but the baffle certainly would would affect uh, airflow through the oil cooler. So if you are having excessive oil temperatures, that could be caused by a baffling problem. Um, obviously, cylinder head temperature is the most direct measure because that's really what we're trying to cool. Um, airflow wouldn't really have an effect on EGT or anything that was noticeable, but it would certainly affect both cylinder head temperature and oil temperature. We've had quite a few people chime in. They've been checking their aircraft spruce catalog. Thank you, everybody. But um, it seems the consensus is that aircraft spruce has what's called um, battle, uh, battle, <laughs> I'm sorry, baffle seal fasteners. And it's what okay. you, you were talking about describing to hold the uh, silicone to silicone. Perfect. Well, aircraft spruce has everything. Yeah, um, don't they? I know they're great. Yeah, I've, why why am I not a stockholder? Well, it's probably because it's not a public company. <laughs> um, so Stan wonders. Um, oh no, not Stan's. Uh, Wendy is wondering about: Are the silicone baffle seals or the felt baffle seals better? And um, what would you use felt? When would you use felt instead of silicone? I must confess, I have never heard of using felt uh, for as as baffle seals, I and mean, it does not does not sound like the material of choice um, for lots of reasons. Um, but that that uh, that's that's a new one on me. I didn't know anybody was using felt for baffle seals. And there were several questions in here too. Do the baffles, silicone baffle seals typically have a service life to them? And do they become more wrinkled as they age? Um, again, I can only go by my experience, but my experience is that the, that the modern silicone baffle seals um, remain pliable throughout their life. Um, I've, got very, very old ones <laughs> on my engines because I take my engines to very, very high time. And uh, there, there's really no evidence of them uh, getting stiff or rigid or, or having any problems like that. Um, the older material, like I said, was just awful, but the modern silicone, thick silicone um, baffle seals seem to last a very long time without any any obvious deterioration. At least that's my personal experience with them. Gary's wondering, uh, does anyone make an improved STC designed baffle system for certified airplanes? Uh, in in some cases, yes. I mean, for, for example, um, uh, Beryl DeShannon is sort of is fairly famous in the Bonanza world uh, for an STC um, baffle system that's an alternative to what beach installed and is designed a lot better um just offhand i don't know of anybody that has say an stc redesigned baffle system for cessnas and and i'm tend to be pretty knowledgeable about cessnas and i'm not aware of, of anything like that but but it's important to understand that a a for a certificated aircraft, a change in the in in the engine cooling system 
is considered a major alteration by the FAA. So it would require um, either an STC or a field approval. And I believe engine cooling system changes are, are ones that nowadays the, the FISDOs will not issue field approvals for. So they basically need to be STC. A lot of people have ideas for how they might be able to cool their their, their legacy aircraft engines better. But you know, um, my recommendation is if you're flying a certificated aircraft, don't go out and start you know cutting aluminum because it really is, is not legal to do that. All right, let's talk about some specifics here. Tom wonders, the CHT of cylinder number six on my 0540 seems to always run marketedly cooler than the other five. Is this possibly a baffle issue? Uh, it is, possibly. And again, I, I, I'd have to know a lot more about the particular aircraft, but uh, your cylinder number six um, on a... Uh, uh, like homing is the is is a, is the rearmost cylinder, um, and normally the rearmost cylinder would have a a rigid vertical baffle pressed right against the 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 aft end of it, um, and if that's if that's not the case or if it's not positioned right and if there's a big gap between the rear cylinder and the and the baffle behind it that that could cause um, you know more cooling airflow in that area that would be robbing cooling airflow from the other cylinders. Um, so I mean that's that's what I would check. I'm I'm sort of flying blind here because I don't know the particular engine installation, but that's the sort of thing that you would you would look for. Andy's wondering, uh, he says he flies a Cherokee 180 with a Lycoming 0360 with superior millennium cylinders. The cylinder cooling fins have a small ridge across them from the casting process. The ridge slightly chokes the cooling airflow. My AMP has suggested knocking the ridge down with a small Dremel bit to improve the cooling flow. Does this make sense to you? Um, if uh, th this is for Lycoming, correct? Yes, uh, O360. Yeah, there is some sometimes, and I'm, I'd be a little surprised if this were true of the superior cylinders because they tend to be a little better cast um, than than the factory cylinders. But sometimes there's, you know, some kind of excessive metal uh, that that remains after the casting process and and if 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 so that it's okay to get rid of it but if if the metal that you're talking about is part of the design of the cylinder then it's not okay to get rid of it um, you, you might improve the cooling but you might create a, um, a a weakness or a stress riser that could cause cylinder head cracks down the road so you, you, again, I don't know exactly what metal he's talking about. I need to see a, a, a good high resolution photograph to be able to pass judgment. But, but it, if, if it's in general, if it's spurious metal, it isn't supposed to be there and is just a result of, of imperfect um, casting, uh, then it would be okay to remove it. But if it's an integral part of the design of the cylinder head, um, then, then it's it's inappropriate to remove it. Ken's wondering how much should the flexible seals wrap onto the cowling? One inch, two inch? What do you think? Typically, there should be at least a good solid half inch of of contact area. And again, the the best way to check contact area is to look at the rub marks. It it it, it it usually is pretty obvious uh, where the contact is. I mean, you, you can't really tell when the engine just sitting on the ground uh, because when the engine, when, when the airplane's in flight, that top 
compartment pressurizes and it presses the seals uh, against the surface. And so they're in a somewhat different configuration than they are when you're looking at them statically on the ground without any air pressure. Um, so the best way to judge the contact area is to look at the rub marks uh, on whatever that flexible seal is sealing against. And um, th th that th there should be a, a nice half inch solid rub mark there indicating that there's that much contact. I don't know if there's a official rule. I'm, I'm pulling that half inch off the top of my head, but you know, like the width of a finger or something. Um, uh, and, and if it's much thinner than that, then you're probably not getting real good contact. Leon is wondering how much of a drawback to cooling is the oxidation on older cylinders? Is there a recommended way to clean them if there's a problem insofar as cooling is concerned? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, if, if we're talking about you know corrosion pitting of the of the aluminum cylinder head, um, I mean there, there's there's a bunch of drawbacks to having corrosion pitting. For example, the the the, the, the corrosion pits can can be stress risers that can eventually lead to head cracks. But from a cooling standpoint, the corrosion would probably actually improve <laughs> the cooling a little bit by, by causing the surface to be rougher. And, and so to increase increasing that the surface area over which the, the cooling air flows. I mean, that's one of the reasons that cylinder heads are normally left as fairly rough castings as opposed to being you know, polished smooth, because the rougher the 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 surface, the the more surface area there is uh, to participate in, you know, the heat exchanger part of the uh, of the cooling system. So I I wouldn't think that that corrosion would impair cooling. If, if anything, it might have a slight opposite effect. Um, but that's not to say that you know a lot of corrosion is is acceptable because it can have other other problems having to do with the structural integrity of the cylinder head. James wonders, so how do I get an engine to run hotter to prevent the lead deposits on valve stems? Well, the, the, the main way you would do that would, would be by leaning uh, um, fairly aggressively. And by the way, the the worst time for lead deposits to, to develop on those valve stems is not in flight, it's during ground operations when the engine is operating at very low power, uh, taxi idle kinds of stuff. And, and so it's, it's when you're doing on the ground where it's really super important to lean brutally um, uh, to minimize the, the uh, uh, the accumulation of, uh, of, of lead deposits. Um, but the main tool that you have is leaning. Um, when you're on the ground, uh, things like cow flaps and stuff don't matter very much because there, there's hardly any airflow going through the system to, to regulate, um, which is why, for example, I, it, I always think it's bad form to do full power runups on the ground. Um, because you're asking the engine to generate lots of heat and then you're not passing any cooling air over it. So uh, try to avoid that. If you want to run an engine up at full power, the best way to do it is with a high-speed taxi down the runway where at least you're getting some, some cooling airflow uh, through the engine. Um, but uh, the, the, main, the main tool that you have is leaning. Rick's wondering, he says, I have a Columbia 400 and uh, cylinders one, three, and five are much hotter than cylinders two, four, and six. Is that normal? No, it's not normal. And it's, it's uh, that when you've got something like that where, where the left bank is hotter than the right or vice versa, that, that's pretty obviously a, a, a cooling air problem. I mean, the probability of having a fuel anomaly that, that put less fuel into the odd numbered cylinders than the even numbered cylinders in a fuel injected engine is uh, somewhere between slim and none. So it has to be a cooling air problem. 
and there has to be an air leak on the on the hot running side of the engine um, and so you need to look look for it and uh, again when you're looking for it don't don't, don't neglect the inner cylinder baffles because uh, that that's uh, an area where especially on those continental engines like you have in the Columbia 400 we see a lot of problems with with those inner cylinder baffles being positioned wrong or you know in the example I gave being installed backwards or or something so that that's one place that you definitely want to look well mike a great presentation tonight excellent questions from everybody who tuned in we had uh, i think over 1400 people i saw at one time so thank you all so much for joining us mike thanks for the presentation wow. please uh, nice. take a moment and share closing thoughts with everybody okay i will i've got some old closing thoughts and some new closing thoughts um as as usual if you're not receiving my newsletter you can sign up for it at savvyaviation.com comes out uh, usually the third week of every month um, email newsletter it's got an unsubscribe link if you have buyer's remorse um, my four books are available on amazon if if you read them please post reviews if you haven't read them think about it <laughs> um, I, I just found out yesterday, I was really, really pleased to find this out, that um, a site called Book Authority, which, which rates books, um, made a list of the 63 best aircraft maintenance books of all time. And the top three books on the list were my books. So I felt pretty good about that. Hey, congratulations. Um, the, uh, I mentioned in the past that I'm creating audio books. And I'm very pleased to announce that the first of those audiobooks, uh, Manifesto, is finally available. Um, it's it, this is this is my first attempt to get an audiobook published through the uh, through the the ACX uh, system, and and they're very very picky, so they sent it back a couple of times because I didn't have quite the right amount of silence at the beginning or the end of a chapter and stuff, but I finally got it to where uh, where they they accepted it and it's now um, available on Audible and on Amazon. Um, here's what it looks like on the on the Audible site. Um, by the way, it's 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 the cheapest way you can you can you can hear my stuff or, or read my stuff. It's the the, the audio book is I, what is it? Six bucks for? Uh, uh, it's actually six ninety-five if you're not an Audible member, and four dollars and eighty-six cents if you are an Audible member. Um, and uh, it's it's a book that I that I read, so you'll you'll hear it in my own voice for whatever good or bad that is. Uh, but at any rate, it's 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 finally up, and I'm starting work on the engines book, which is the next one. And that's gonna that's a pretty big project because as you probably know the engines book is is a 500 pager so it's going to take a little while to get all that stuff on audio but i'm working on that um there's only about five reviews up on the audible site so if if you if you decide to get the audio book please uh please post reviews i would very much appreciate it um upcoming webinars uh february and march i i have a, a pair of webinars about uh, magneto ignition systems. Uh, the February one is called How Mags Work and the March one is called How Mags Fail. <laughs> so between the two of them, we're pretty much going to cover mags. And um, on April 7th, uh, I've got an interesting webinar called How Risky is Maintenance, where we dive into a, a study that uh, the FAA actually did of maintenance-induced uh, accidents and uh, find out about what the incidents of those are and what kinds of things cause them and so on. It's kind of interesting stuff. And and finally, um, um, Tim mentioned Home Builders Week, um, and um, I think I am have the the the, the honor of being tail end Charlie <laughs> on Home Builders Week. Uh, on the last day of Home Builders Week, I'm going to be doing a uh, 
a special webinar uh, on how to break in your engine the right way. Um, so that is all I have, Tim, for tonight. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, wonderful presentation. Many people are commenting. Thank you. Awesome presentation. Another great session. Great way to start off the new year. So wonderful. Thank you so much. And to everybody who tuned in, thank you so much for joining us. As I said, I think we had over 1,400. That's just so encouraging um, that so many people are tuning into this. Thank you all so much. And uh, tell your friends. We got up to 3,000 seats now since we transitioned to this new system. So we got a lot of growing room here. So tell your friends and uh, enjoy. Um, uh, invite them to join in on this schedule with us, eaa.org slash webinars. Have a great night, everybody. See you next time. Good night, everybody.